it speaks to the inability of Alabama's defense to dictate a game, to have any kind of game control, to have any ability to make the offense uncomfortable. When I watch Alabama play this year, they might win and they might put up good numbers on both sides of the ball, but they are dictated too by the opposing offense. They don't force a lot of three and outs, which puts their def- their offense in a bad spot. The, the, the high line of that statistic was Alabama starts more five-star players than they have gotten turnovers this year, which is insane to me. They forced six turnovers this year. Josh, maybe you want to touch on the defense. Maybe you want to drive, dive right into the offensive numbers. But either way, the floor is yours to talk about some concerning trends for Alabama football. Yeah, there's a few things to note here. And to your point on turnovers, one of the things that leads to is Alabama's 49th in the country in opponent red zone scoring percentage. They they allow scores in about 81% uh, of opponent red zone trips, which is not particularly good, uh, especially when you consider that it's supposedly an elite defense. Um, and so, I mean, there's a lot of factors to it. In theory, Alabama's defense is kind of trying to adapt to some modern concepts around being but bend but don't break because of the way RPO has affected college football. Everybody's kind of gone to the theory that you need to drop your safeties just every play, let them catch deep routes and let them catch run plays downfield. You just don't want to be attacking the line of scrimmage too often because if you do that, you're going to give up really easy deep shots. So most people kind of played off and Alabama is, is kind of, particularly passive, I think, schematically with how they do things between the 20s. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to soldier through this as best I can today. Um, but I think the thing that's telling is even when they get to the red zone, they, they can't firm up. And I think that's the most most sort of scarring thing. But let me give you an example. When I talk about being passive, it's really over the top. And I think a lot of people that follow Alabama have kind of been aware that they've been running this what's called it like a two, four, five base defense. It's kind of strange. Their base scheme now only has two defensive linemen on the field. They play with four linebackers. So they have two, usually it's like a DT and a D end. They'll have two outside linebackers. So they play with Turner and Anderson. Uh, usually the D linemen this year for them are Otis and Young. And then inside linebacker, they've got the two guys to Oto, and then they've kind of rotated the other spot. Uh, and then they play behind that. Uh, a 5 DB shell. So they're playing in a nickel, essentially, but only with two defensive linemen. That's caused them to be a little weak at times at stopping the run because you're undersized. I talked about in the preview for Alabama, my biggest concern with them is I didn't think their D line was particularly good in terms of depth and quality. Um, And I let me be really clear, I'm not talking about linebackers. So Turner, um, Anderson, Braswell is another one. Those guys are not who I'm discussing right now because those guys aren't 300 pounds, okay? I'm talking about your 270-plus guys that you need to really stop the run. They don't have a Barmore. They don't have a Quinnen Williams on this roster. Young is the best guy they have. I think he's probably an NFL draft pick. I don't think he's a first, maybe even second-day draft pick. Um, And so I get somewhat why they do it, uh, but they have, at times, been susceptible to the run. Where things get crazy is... Even though this hasn't worked at times, even though Tennessee in particular absolutely gashed them out of these fronts, and as much as the pass killed them against Tennessee, I think the thing people missed is that Tennessee was consistently averaging over six yards a carry. I forget what the number was, but I think the main backs finished about seven yards a carry in that game. It was the inability that Alabama had to ever get them in third and long because they started on second and three every series that really broke them. Well, in the LSU game late, when LSU was moving the ball down the field and they couldn't stop Daniels as a runner and they were getting worn down, Alabama left the 2-4-5 set and they went to a 1-4-6. I'm not making that up. I don't think I've ever seen it before. And I'm going to show you now a couple still images. Um, We don't do still images a ton and and it somewhat is due to licensing issues. Um, really more than, you know, any, any effort on our part, we don't want to get our channel demonetized. Um, but I think still images should be fine, um, for copyright purposes. Um, here you see this first play, this was third and five. This was the last scoring drive in regulation for LSU, a really pivotal play on their own 29 yard line. This is the play where, uh, Jaden Daniels had a 34 yard carry. And the thing that I'm highlighting here is the personnel Alabama had on the field on third and five. They had one defensive lineman. That's the lineman Burroughs, who's, I think, like their fifth leading tackler among D linemen. This is effectively like a second or third string guy, the only D lineman on the field. 
They've got two inside linebackers head up on a tackle. They've got two outside linebackers attacking guards. LSU has six in protection, so that means not only are they outmassing Alabama by about 40 pounds per player, they've got an extra blocker to boot. And it's not shocking on this play that they end up getting a seam where Daniels is able to run down the field. And because Alabama brings all five of these guys, they don't even have a spy, they've got no one to catch them. So Daniels ends up really far into Alabama territory and sets up that last touchdown. To me, this is baffling. Third and five is a, a down where anything can happen. And if you're going to bring five guys on a blitz, and let me be clear, Alabama substituted into this set. <laughs> I think it was the prior play. Why are you going to blitz five guys where four of them are all undersized? And rather than having Anderson and Turner, who are excellent speed rushers, rushing on the outside, you've got them trying to run over a guard who outweighs them by 60 pounds. And on the outside, you've got two inside linebackers that the tackles are massively bigger than. It, it doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. And so that's, that's one example. And let me show you another one, which was one of the more pivotal plays in the game. Uh, this was a third and seven play, same drive. Later on, Alabama's trying to stop LSU from scoring. Uh, and this is the play where Williams ends up having a big carry and gets about to the, I think, the nine-yard line. Um, it's the same set. Alabama has one defensive lineman. Right now, it's young. They've actually substituted, but they've substituted, but they've kept the same scheme. They have five guys lined up in the line of scrimmage. They actually bring the nickel back, which I show here. So they're going to bring six. Uh, LSU has six in protection. But the problem is, again, Alabama is grossly undersized. And I guess their assumption is, well, there's no way LSU is going to run the ball because it's long yardage. But LSU does the sensible thing. They ran it because they have such a size advantage. And again, remember LSU's in four down territory here because they've got to score a touchdown late in the game. They're probably not going to get another possession. So they're more than happy to run the ball and set it up. And I'll show another clip here to sort of say, show here from this still what happened. But you have the inside linebacker and the outside linebacker on the right side of the line of scrimmage just get blown straight backwards. Now that's, I think, Toa Toa and Anderson because they're, one's on a guard, one's on a tackle. They're just massively undersized for this role. Anderson is probably going to be the number one pick in the NFL draft, but he's not a D lineman. You can't ask him to try to act like a defensive tackle and just bull rush a guard. Um, in the same way that if you try to take you know, I don't know, you, you try to take a Jadavian Clowney or anybody like that, and you try to have him bull rush a, a guard from the inside. It's not typically going to work that well uh, on, on most instances, especially when he's got an outs an inside linebacker outside him, so the tackle is able to get a lot of push. The thing I note here is that the 1D lineman actually gets a ton of penetration. He's actually three or four yards in the backfield. It doesn't matter, though, because the, the two uh, linemen on the right have driven him so far back that the first contact happens about two yards downfield, and that's Moody. Moody ends up missing the tackle. That's the inside linebacker, number 42. Uh, and by the time uh, that he misses the tackle, these two uh, inside and outside linebackers have been driven all the way to the first down marker. And Williams ends up sort of falling between them. The safety tackles him about the 10. So you think this is a, like a bad play because Alabama misses the tackle here from Moody. But this is sort of the game within the game sometimes, right? When we talk about trying to break down stuff. And this is why I think their schemes are criminally bad. It, you know, Moody misses the tackle. But the reason it's so catastrophic is that there's no one else to catch him. And the blockers are so far downfield that they end up having a first time, a first down by the time it happens. This is why their red zone percentages are so bad. I don't know why on earth you would ever try to play with only one defensive lineman on the field. And it just ends up setting up LSU to go score a touchdown. If Alabama had gotten a stop here, Alabama probably wins the game. And this is nothing more than an unforced error in a bizarre scheme. And, you know, I, I think Saban had made a comment earlier this week that, you know, the buck stops with him. And sometimes they have to realize when they do or don't um, try to do something that's a little too much, a little too less. This is an example of it. So I really wanted to walk through this because I don't think you guys would have believed me if I didn't show it to show the schemes that Alabama has been running and how absolutely insane it is in my view. I mean, this is just criminal. Um, and I understand you want to get more pass rushers on the field and things like that, but there's a reason teams don't play with one defensive lineman on the field in crucial situations. You're so outmanned from a size pers perspective. Out and remember LSU was throwing the ball for about 6.4 yards per attempt. They were not throwing the ball well in this game. But really, this scheme, and particularly on this drive, in a game where LSU only scored a few times, 
was the thing that really sealed their fate. 